Thank you so much. <clears throat> Believe it or not, and I know most people do not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and today we are probably living in the most peaceful era in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought rates of violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. But I hope to persuade you that it is a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. I'm going to walk you through six major historical declines of violence, try to identify their immediate causes, that is, particular historical events of uh, that era, and then try to tie them together in terms of their ultimate causes, namely general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first decline of violence I call the pacification process. Until approximately 6,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was life like in this state of nature? This is a question that thinkers have, po have posed for literally hundreds of years. In 1651, Thomas Hobbes famously wrote that in a state of nature, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. A century later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. Now, these two theoreticians were speculating from the armchair. Neither of them had any idea what life was like in uh, non-state societies. But today we can do better because there are two sources of evidence on rates of violence in societies living in anarchy. The first is forensic archaeology. You can think of this as CSI Paleolithic. Namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons show signs of violent trauma, such as bashed in skulls, decapitations, bones with arrowheads embedded in them, or mummies found with ropes around their necks? Um, I've uh, assembled 20 estimates that I've been able to find, and as you can see, they uh, span quite a, a range, but they average out to uh, 15%. That is about 15% of prehistoric skeletons show signs of unhealed violent trauma. Let's compare that 15% figure to those from some more recent eras, such as Europe and the United States in the uh, 20th century uh, with their uh, two world wars, which come out to a rate of six-tenths of 1%. The world in the 20th century, if you now try to uh, estimate the upper bound value for the number of people killed in the 20th century, not just in direct um, deaths on the battlefield, but also indirect deaths from starvation and disease, uh, the deaths in genocides and the deaths from man-made famines, you can push the rate up to about 3%. And here is the figure for the world in the 21st century. The bar is invisible because it is less than one pixel high, corresponding to a rate of about three-tenths of a percent. The second way to estimate rates of death in non-state societies comes from ethnographic vital statistics. Now, the wave of uh, agriculture and settlement and civilization and government that swept over the world starting about 6,000 years ago left a few pockets of the world still in anarchy, namely hunter-gatherer, hunter-horticultural, and other tribal societies. And ethnographers who have lived with them for long stretches of time have tabulated their uh, causes, rates of death from various causes, including warfare. Uh, I found 27 estimates uh, in the literature, and once again, they span uh, quite a range. But they average out to 524 per 100,000 per year. 100,000 per year is a, a standard way of estimating uh, rates of violence. That is, every year about one half of one percent of the population is felled in warfare. Is that a high number or a low number? Well, again, we can compare it to comparable data from um, more modern societies, and I'll stack the deck against modernity by picking some of the most violent countries in their most violent centuries such as Germany in the 20th century with its two world wars, which had a rate of 144. 
Russia in the 20th century, two world wars and a civil war with a rate of 135. Japan in the 20th century, a world war that ended in two nuclear strikes with a rate of 27. United States in the 20th century, which uh, acquired the reputation of a warmonger because of its participation in two world wars and some half a dozen other for, uh, foreign wars with a rate of 3.7. If you try to get the maximum credible estimate for the world as a whole in the 20th century. Once again, aggregating the direct battlefield deaths with the indirect deaths from hunger and disease, plus the genocides and the man-made famines, you uh, come out with a rate of about 60. And here is the world in the uh, 21st century. Once again, the graph is invisible because it is less than one pixel high. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when it comes to life in a state of nature, Hobbes came much closer to the truth than Rousseau. The immediate cause seems to be the rise and expansion of states, giving rise to the various paxes or pieces that uh, hist history students read about, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Hispanica, and so on. Uh, in general, when a state exerts control over a territory, it tries to stamp out the endemic tribal raiding and feuding, not because the early kings and emperors had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their citizens, but rather because tribal raiding and feuding uh, are a nuisance to the imperial overlords, who would just as soon keep the people alive to supply them with soldiers and taxes and slaves. So just as a farmer has an interest in preventing his livestock from killing each other, he doesn't particularly care what they're fighting about, and it's just a dead loss to him, so the early kings and emperors tried to stamp out the tribal raiding and feuding in the territories they sought to pacify. A couple of direct comparisons of this hypothesis come, first of all, from a uh, study of um, museum collections of skeletons from pre-Columbian societies uh, divided into those that had a hunter-gatherer lifestyle uh, as opposed to those that were under the control of a centralized state. The hunter-gatherers uh, skeletons had a rate of um, violent trauma of about 13 percent. The state skeletons from state societies a rate of less than 3 percent. For ethnographic vital statistics, the only pre-post comparison I've been able to find came from comparison of the rate of homicide among the Kung San the, uh, of the Kalahari, the so-called Bushmen, before and after the imposition of uh, uh, state control by the Botswana government, uh, whereupon the rate of homicide fell from uh, more than 40 per 100,000 per year to less than 30 in just a few years. Now, the second decline of violence can be appreciated by uh, examining this woodcut, showing a typical day in the life in the Middle Ages. And the process that brought this mayhem under control has been called the civilizing process, for reasons I'll soon explain. It turns out that in many parts of Europe, homicide statistics go back literally 800 years, and historical uh, criminologists have plotted them over time, such as in this graph, which I adapted from uh, Manuel Eisner, plotted on a s logarithmic scale from a tenth of a homicide per 100,000 per year to 1 to 10 to 100. And uh, as you can see, there's been a massive decline in the rate of homicide in England, uh, so, such that a contemporary Englishman has about a 1 135th the chance of being murdered compared to his medieval ancestors. This is true not just in England, but in every country for which historical data exist that I know of. Um, here we have comparable data for uh, Italy, the Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, and Scandinavia. In this graph, I have averaged those five regions, and for the sake of comparison, have also plotted that 524 per 100,000 figure for the non-state societies. So more or less, this gap is what I call the pacification process, this further decline, the civilizing process. Now, I stole the name from the title of a famous book by the German sociologist Norbert Elias, in which he argued that in the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms out of the medieval patchwork of duchies and baronies and principalities. With it, criminal justice was nationalized. 
and the constant feuding and brigandage and warlording of the medieval knights began to give way to the king's justice. Also during this era, there was a growing infrastructure of commerce. There was uh, the growth of money and contracts and other financial instruments that could be recognized and enforced within the boundaries of the newly consolidated states. And there were improvements in the physical infrastructure of trade and commerce, such as roads and carts and instruments of timekeeping. As a result, zero-sum plunder began to give way to positive-sum trade. And that is a uh, general theme that I'll return to at the end of the lecture. The third major decline of violence was, uh, is best appreciated by recalling some of the ways that the early states and empires kept law and order within their uh, borders, namely uh, horrific forms of sadistic corporal and capital punishment, such as breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, sawing in half, and impalement. But in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, country after country abolished these uh, sadistic practices in a wave of abolitions uh, whoops, sorry. Here we go. Uh, centered in the second half of the 18th century, where uh, uh, jurisdiction after jurisdiction uh, banned the use of torture as a form of criminal punishment, including the United States in our prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which actually occurred smack in the middle of this uh, overall trend. Also abolished during, uh, oh, I'm sorry, also abolished during this period was the profligate use of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In 18th century England, the death penalty was prescribed for 222 different offenses, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child aged 7 to 14 years of age. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, the death penalty was prescribed and uh, frequently used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. Indeed, this graph, which plots the uh, percentage of American execution for crimes other than murder, from colonial times, 1650, to the present, shows that in colonial times, a majority of executions were for crimes other than uh, murder. More recently, the only crime that has been punished by death other than murder is conspiracy to commit murder. Now, the death penalty itself, of course, has been abolished in pretty much every Western democracy except the United States. Uh, this timeline shows the number of European countries with capital punishment and um, as you can see, most of the abolitions actually took place in the uh, second half of the 20th century, but the blue timeline, which shows the number of European countries that actually carry out executions, reveals that well before politicians got around to striking capital punishment from their country's law books, their citizens had pretty much lost their taste for uh, actually putting people to death. And on average, 50 years elapsed between the last actual execution in a European country and the time that it was formally abolished. Now, I mentioned that the United States is an exception to this trend, or I should say that um, uh, 32 of the 50 states are exceptions to this trend because capital punishment has abolished, been abolished in the other 18, including uh, three abolitions just in the two years between the time I wrote the first draft of the book and the time that, it, that uh, I uh, turned it in for publication. But uh, this graph shows that even in the United States, capital punishment is a shadow of its former self. This graph plots the number of executions uh, per capita in the United States from colonial times to the present. And uh, you can see that far fewer people are being uh, executed uh, in the United States today than was true in previous centuries. Nowadays, about 40 people per year are put to uh, death in the United States, a country that has more than 16,000 homicides. And so it's almost an academic question where the United States really has uh, capital punishment. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were uh, witch hunts, uh, religious persecution such as burning heretics, uh, 
uh, dueling among men of honor, an abolition that is uh, uh, beautifully chronicled in uh, the book by another speaker at this conference, Anthony Appiah, in his book, The Honor Code. Blood sports such as bear baiting and dog fighting, debtors' prisons, and most famously of all, slavery, uh, another abolition uh, happily also uh, covered in uh, Anthony Appiah's book. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything particularly wrong with it. The Bible had no problem with, with uh, slavery. So-called democratic Athens was a slave-holding society. But starting in the second half of the 18th century, there was a trickle of abolitions that eventually grew into a wave that overcame uh, the entire world, culminating in 1980 when Mauritania became the last country on earth to abolish legal slavery. And so we're living in a unique period in human history in which the institution of slavery is illegal everywhere on earth. What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? One might plausibly guess, guess that it was the rise in affluence, that perhaps as life gets longer and safer and more pleasant, people put a higher value on their own lives and hence by extension on the lives of others. Uh, unfortunately for this plausible hypothesis, the timing doesn't really seem to work. Economic historians tell us that uh, the rise in living standards uh, first enjoyed by the West only really began to take off in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution and was pretty much flat during most of the 18th century, the era in which these humanitarian reforms uh, originated. I think at least in terms of a putative cause coming before the putative effect, a more plausible case could be made for the rise of printing and literacy. This graph shows that prior to the 18th century, there was a 25-fold increase in the economic efficiency of manufacturing a, a book, the only industry to show a rise in productivity prior to the Industrial Revolution. This graph shows that during the 18th century, those uh, economic improvements were put into practice and there was an exponential growth in the number of books published per decade, a kind of early version of Moore's Law. And uh, here we see that it was during the 18th century that for the first time a majority of the population, uh, at least initially a majority of men, although women soon caught up, uh, could read those books. That is when literacy rate exceeded the 50% mark. Why should literacy matter? Well, there's another name for this era. It is also called the Enlightenment because this is the era in which knowledge began to replace superstition and ignorance. It is not implausible that a population that is better educated and more literate is less likely to believe in uh, notions such as that Jews poison wells, heretics go to hell, crop failures are caused by witches, Children are possessed by the devil, which has to be beaten out of them. Africans are brutish and fit only for slavery. And that's bound to undermine many institutionalized rationales for violence. As Voltaire said during this era, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Also, literacy is a technology of cosmopolitanism, of the mixing of peoples and ideas. And it's uh, not implausible, this has been argued by the um, scholar Lynn Hunt at uh, Berkeley, that as people began to consume more fiction and drama and history and journalism, they uh, got into the habit of uh, occupying other people's minds, of trying to imagine what life would be like from the uh, perspective of someone who is not you and not like you. Uh, and that plausibly could increase people's circle of empathy and decrease their tendency to dehumanize and their taste for cruelty. Uh, and that too is a hypothesis that I'll return to toward the end of the talk. The uh, fourth decline of violence has been called the long peace. And it speaks to the frequently made assertion that the 20th century was the most violent in history. An assertion that is never in my experience made with reference to facts or data from any century other than the 20th. And so this is a trend based on uh, one data point. And there are a number of reasons to doubt that it is true. 
Even comparing the 20th against the so-called peaceful 19th century uh, makes it unclear whether uh, the 19th century really was uh, so peaceful after all. This, after all, was a century that saw the Napoleonic Wars, one of the most destructive wars in European history, with four million deaths. The most destructive civil war in history, namely the Taiping Re Rebellion in China, with 20 million deaths. The most destructive war in American history, the Civil War, with 650,000. In Africa, the conquests of Shaka Zulu, which perhaps killed one to two million people. In South America, the most destructive interstate war in history as a proportion of the population that was affected. 60% of the population of Paraguay died in the War of the Triple Alliance. And then there were slave raiding wars in Africa and imperial wars in Africa, Asia, and South Pacific where the uh, death rate can't even begin to be estimated. Also, while it is um, un undoubtedly true that the Second World War was the worst thing that ever happened in human history in terms of the absolute number of people who were killed, it's less clear that it was the worst thing in human history in terms of the population of the world that was uh, affected at the time. Uh, this graph uh, consists of a data set from a man who calls himself an atrocitologist, Matthew White, from uh, a list called the 100 Worst Things That People Have Ever Done to Each Other. Uh, that, that we know of. And I've taken White's estimates and simply divided them by the population of the world at the midpoint of the war or atrocity and plotted them as a function of time from 500 BCE to 2000 CE. Now, as you can see, history's worst atrocities were pretty evenly sprinkled over 2,500 years of human history. Uh, world War II only comes in at ninth place, and World War I doesn't even make the top ten. Now, you can also see that the data cloud kind of funnel downward as you get closer to the present. Presumably, this does not mean that in ancient times they only committed really big atrocities and that more recently we've also committed medium-sized and small-sized atrocities. A more plausible explanation is that this is an artifact of the historical record. The uh, closer you get to the present, the more wars and atrocities got written down. That in ancient times, a lot of the small stuff consisted of trees falling in the forest with uh, no one to hear them. Uh, we can zoom in on the last half millennium, the uh, period since the invention of the uh, printing press, when we do have a data set that is quite revealing in terms of trends in war. This is a data set compiled by Jack Levy on great power war. These are the wars that embroiled the great powers, the 800 pound guerrillas of the day, the states and empires that could project military force beyond their own uh, borders. No one could have missed the wars that the great powers got involved in. And because of the statistical distribution of wars, namely a power law function, the, it turns out that the deaths in the wars that involve the great powers account for a majority of the deaths from all wars combined. So let's look at uh, what happens in great power war over the last half millennium. The first graph shows the proportion of years in which the great powers fought each other what one could uh, justifiably call world wars. And it shows that 500 years ago, uh, and for a couple of hundred years, the great powers were pretty much always at war with each other. And that was what great powers did. They fought other great powers. That's how you became a great power. But in more recent uh, centuries, the great powers have hardly ever fought each other. The second graph shows the duration of wars with a great power on at least one side. And it shows that there has been a decline in the uh, duration of wars involving a great power. In uh, the world used to see things like the 30 Years War, the 80 Years War, the 100 Years War. The 20th century saw the Six Day War. This graph shows the frequency of uh, wars involving a great power. And once again, we see a decline. Uh, this fourth graph, however, shows a trend that went in the opposite direction for most of this history. That is uh, a statistic called the, that I call the deadliness of war. Namely, once a great power did start a war, how many people was it able to kill per country per year? And because of uh, 
advances, if you want to call it that, in military organization and uh, weaponry, there was an increase in how efficiently countries could uh, kill people until the until 1950, when that curve does a U-turn. And so for the last two-thirds of a century, we've been living in an era in which the frequency of war has been going down, the duration of war has been going down, and for two-thirds of a century, the deadliness of war has been going down. If you multiply these figures out to tabulate the total number of people killed in war, then you get a uh, kind of a zigzaggy curve, but one whose lowest point in 500 years is the last quarter of the 20th century. Now for this 100 year period, the 20th century, the data get better yet again, and we can zoom in and look at the rate of death from all wars, not just the great power wars. And what it shows us is that though there is unmistakably uh, two uh, horrific spikes of bloodletting centered around the two world wars, the Second World War was something closer to a last gasp than a harbinger of things to come. And the rest of the curve uh, snakes down along the floor of the graph, continuing to the present era. This is the era that has been called the long peace. The fact that since 1946 there's been a historically unprecedented decline in interstate war. That's wars with a government on each side. And in fact, the most interesting statistic from this period is zero. Uh, there have been zero wars. There were zero wars between the United States and the Soviet Union, the two greatest powers of them all until the Soviet Union went out of existence. Uh, a um, happy conclusion foreseen by no one, all of the experts in international relations predicted that a war between the United States and the Soviet Union was just a matter of time. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki. Again, uh, contrary to every prediction from the experts who said that a nuclear war uh, was uh, just a matter of time. There have been no wars between any two great powers since the end of the Korean War more than half a century ago. No wars between any two Western European countries, a fact that nowadays we kind of take for granted. You might even think, well, of, of course there haven't. Who would ever expect that France and Germany would fight a war, or Germany and Poland? But needless to say, this is a historically highly unusual state of affairs. Prior to 1945, Western European states alone started two new wars a year for 600 years, as of 1945, that figure fell to zero. And there have been no wars between developed countries. The 40 or so countries with the highest GDP per capita uh, have not fought each other since 1945. Again, a conclusion that one might think is banal and obvious because we've grown up thinking of wars as uh, things that take place in those poor backward parts of the world. But uh, in fact, for most of human history, it was the big rich countries that were constantly at each other's throats. And because big rich countries can afford big powerful armies, uh, they can do a lot of damage. Well, what about the rest of the world? I've spoken about uh, developed states. I've talked about great powers. I've talked about Western Europe. But more recently, in a process that I call the new peace, the long peace seems to be spreading to the rest of the world. Now, as I mentioned, since 1946, there have been fewer interstate wars, country against country. There have, however, been more civil wars as newly independent states, often with inept governments, defended themselves against insurgent movements, both sides uh, armed, financed, and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. But after the end of the Cold War, the number of civil wars declined as well, uh, which raises the question, with what type of war kills more people? The old-fashioned interstate wars, which have become far less frequent, or the newfangled civil wars, which increased prior to a decrease in the uh, post-war years? Well, this graph uh, allows us to compare them. It shows the deadliness of uh, interstate wars and two categories of civil war in each decade from 1950 to 2005, starting with the interstate wars. Uh, and here again is the uh, rather severe decline in how deadly interstate wars uh, have been. 
Here we have the rate of death from internationalized civil wars. These are civil wars where some um, third power butts in, usually on the side of the government. And here is the rate of death from it purely internal civil wars. And what the graph shows us is that the rise in the death rate from uh, civil wars uh, nowhere near ma makes up for the decline in the rate of death from the interstate wars. Uh, this graph now aggregates those two figures. How many wars are there? How many people get killed per war? It's a stacked layer graph that shows the total rate of death from each of four categories of war. The uh, thickness of each wedge shows the deadly, the sorry, the uh, rate of death in war, um, and the height of the entire stack shows the rate of death from all wars combined. So first we have the colonial wars, where a European empire tried to hang on to its colonies, which tapered off to zero by the 1970s. Here we have the rate of death in interstate wars, which shows peaks for the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and the Iran-Iraq War. Here we have the rate of death from internal civil wars and internationalized civil wars. So the entire pattern shows a somewhat bumpy roller coaster, but one whose overall trend is unmistakably downward, culminating in this thin laminate of layers showing that in the 21st century, we've been living through an era with an unprecedentedly low rate of death from all wars combined. Well, the graph ends in 2008. That was the last year for which data were available when I turned in the manuscript for The Better Angels of Our Nature, from which this talk is adapted. And one might ask whether in the wake of the Arab Spring, with its conflicts in Libya and Syria, this trend has been reversed. Fortunately, uh, the data set has recently been extended to the year 2012. And uh, here's what we find. There has indeed been an uptick in the total rate of death in the last year, mostly corresponding to the deaths in uh, Syria. But as a, uh, on a global scale, this doesn't come anywhere close to reversing the trend that the world has been enjoying over the last uh, two-thirds of a century. Uh, let me just turn from war for uh, a minute or two and, uh, and, and uh, speak about genocide, where we'll define war as um, armed conflict between two armed forces and genocide as one armed force killing unarmed civilians. Uh, one often reads that the 20th century was the age of genocide. Uh, again, this is a claim made without uh, even a nod to the possibility of genocide in other centuries. I've looked at every history of genocide that I could find, and they are unanimous in denying that the 20th century was uh, unique in being an age of genocide. I'll just read to you from the first paragraph of one of these histories, Frank Chalk and Kurt Jonason's The History of Genocide. And here's how they begin their book. Genocide has been practiced in all regions of the world and during all periods in history. We know that in ancient times, empires have disappeared and that cities were destroyed, but we do not know what happened to the bulk of the populations involved in these events. Their fate was simply too unimportant. When they were mentioned at all, they were usually lumped together with the herds of oxen, sheep, and other livestock. Looking at the available evidence from antiquity, one might develop a hypothesis that most wars of that time were genocidal in character. Well, what do they mean? Uh, well, if you take the events narrated in the Bible seriously, there was a genocide every couple of pages, uh, most of them commanded by uh, Yahweh, who told the Israelites to put to the edge of the sword every last uh, man, woman, and child of the Amalekites, Amorites, Canaanites, Hivites, Hittites, Jebusites, Midianites, uh, Perizzites, and so on. Now, of course, most of the events narrated in the uh, Hebrew Bible did not take place, but they do reflect an attitude, which is that genocide is an excellent thing, as long as it doesn't happen to you. More historically credible are the uh, accounts of the Athenians in uh, Melos, the Romans in Carthage, the Mongol invasions, the Crusades, the European wars of religion, and many uh, episodes during the colonization, colonization of the Americas, Africa, and Australia. Uh, what about the 
Uh, well, basically what this history tells us is that the so-called age of genocide is the age in which people started to care about genocide. Uh, most historians who care about glorious leaders and the rise and fall of states just simply didn't pay attention to the massacre of unarmed civilians. It just wasn't an interesting part of the story. And that's what changed in the 20th century, as indexed by the fact that the word genocide itself was only coined in 1944. Well, what about the 20th century? One often reads that the genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda have shown that the world has none, learned nothing since the Holocaust and that uh, the, uh, nothing has changed since then. Well, this graph, which shows two estimates of the trajectory of uh, genocide in the 20th century, uh, puts the lie to uh, that, that uh, particular claim. Um, it's hard to say that there is anything uh, uh, heartwarming or optimistic about this graph, which, of course, shows a, uh, the massive um, spike in genocides during the 1940s and a, a bumpy and slow decline thereafter. But what we can see is that though the number of genocides, in the, uh, sorry, the rate of death in genocides has not gone to zero, it has uh, plunged significantly and we are uh, most definitely are not living in an era comparable to the uh, middle of the 20th century. Okay, what were the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? Well, three of them were uh, tossed out as hypotheses by Immanuel Kant in his essay, Perpetual Peace, 200 years ago, in which he suggested that democracy, international trade, and an international community all uh, worked to disincentivize leaders from dragging their countries into stupid wars. More recently, the political scientists Bruce Russett and John O'Neill have tested Kant's hypothesis quantitatively using a large data set of militarized industrial disputes, sorry, mil militarized international disputes. And they showed that all three of these causal factors have increased in the second half of the 20th century, and all of them are statistical predictors of peace in the uh, future, holding all other factors constant. Here we see that uh, the uh, number of democracies has increased worldwide and the number of autocracies has decreased. The world now has far more democracies than autocracies. This graph shows that international trade skyrocketed after the Second World War. This graph shows that the uh, formation of an international community as indexed by intergovernmental organizations has been increasing uh, through the 20th century, but with an acceleration following World War II. And here we see the uh, rise of a different kind of international community, namely peacekeeping forces, those uh, organized by the United Nations and other uh, coalitions, where the number of peacekeeping operations is increased, but even more significantly, the number of peacekeepers, that is the size uh, and organization of those forces, has increased. And other statistical studies have shown that despite some notorious failures, on average, peacekeepers really do keep the peace. Finally, we have the rights revolutions. The targeting of violence on smaller scales directed at vulnerable sectors of the population, such as African Americans, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. The civil rights movement in the United States put an end to the practice of lynching, which uh, used to take place in the end of the 19th century at a rate of 150 a year. That's three a week. By the 1950s, that had gone down to zero. The closest equivalent in modern times uh, is, is the category of hate crime murders of blacks, which the FBI began to tabulate in the 1990s. Note that this graph is um, denominated not in terms of number of murders per 100,000 people, but number of uh, murders, period. Uh, there were never very many of them, but even they declined from five a year to one a year. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks have been in decline since the FBI started recording them, such as intimidation and assault. And the kind of racist attitudes that helped encourage violence against African Americans have been in steady decline. Here we have two uh, graphs showing the 
results of public opinion polls that have been posed to white Americans over the decades, one of which asked white Americans, do you think black and white students should go to separate schools? The other, if a black family moved in next door, would you move out? You can see the steady decline to the point where they are now, uh, most recently they were in the single digits. This is the range of uh, crank opinion, and the questions are no longer even included in public opinion polls. There's some reason to think that this is not just an American phenomenon, but a worldwide one. Uh, here we show from 1950 to the present the number of countries that have various apartheid and Jim Crow laws on the books, that is laws that discriminate against ethnic minorities which have been in decline. The blue line shows the number of countries that bend over backward in the other direction with various affirmative action or remedial discrimination policies that try to give a, uh, a leg up on their uh, oppressed minorities. We are now living in a period where more countries have affirmative action policies than have uh, Jim Crow or apartheid policies. The women's rights revolution has seen an 80% decrease in the rate of rape from its uh, peak in the 1970s. A similarly dramatic decline in the rate of domestic violence and sharp declines in the rate of the most extreme form of domestic violence of all, namely axoricide, the murder of wives and girlfriends, and uh, mariticide, the murder of husbands and boyfriends. As you can see, the decline is even steeper for male victims than it is for female victims, showing that the women's movement has been very, very good for husbands. The children's rights revolution has seen a steady decline in the number of American states that permit corporal punishment in schools, that is, uh, paddling and um, uh, strapping. Uh, every public opinion poll has shown a decline in uh, Western nations' approval of spanking. In some uh, European countries, the spanking of a child by his parents is uh, illegal. Rates of uh, physical and sexual abuse have been in decline since statistics first were kept. And the victimization of children by other children has been in decline, the number of fights and the number of non-fatal crimes in schools. The gay rights revolution has seen a steady increase in the number of nation states worldwide that have decriminalized homosexuality, notwithstanding the setback two weeks ago in which Uganda uh, criminalized homosexuality. This uh, process has also been inexorable in the United States, culminating in 2004 when the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional to outlaw consenting uh, homosexual activity. So it's 50 out of 50 states. Anti-gay attitudes have been in decline throughout the Western world uh, since the 1970s, such as the number of people uh, opining that homosexuality is morally wrong, should be made illegal, or that gay people should be denied equal opportunity. And the hate crime of intimidation, uh, uh, of uh, gay bashing, has been in decline since statistics were kept. Finally, the animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting, an increase in vegetarianism, both in the UK and the US, and a sharp de decline in the number of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. Well, now we have to confront the question, why has violence declined on so many scales of time and magnitude? One theoretical possibility is that human nature itself has changed, and somehow our biological inclinations toward violence have literally been bred out of us. Well, for a number of reasons, I consider this to be highly unlikely. Some of the declines have taken place far too rapidly to have been the result of Darwinian natural selection in a generation or two. Also, we still see violence in our unsocialized children. The most violent stage of life is not, as many people believe, uh, between 15 and 30, but rather the age of two. The reason we uh, don't think of it as violence is that a two-year-old just can't do a whole lot of damage. If two-year-olds had access to guns, it would be a very different story. Uh, grown up, oh, oh and um, uh, in the literature on, uh, cross-cultural literature on sex differences, the most robust sex difference is play fighting and rough and tumble play in little boys. Now, grown-up little boys and many grown-up little girls continue to take enormous pleasure in uh, having episodes of violence staged for their enjoyment. 
such as murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, hockey, and a, a movie starring a certain ex-governor of California. And then there are homicidal fantasies. A number of social psychologists have asked people, have you ever fantasized about killing someone? And the results are instructive. They show that about 15% of women and about a third of men frequently think about killing other people. And about 60% of women and more than three quarters of men at least occasionally think about killing uh, other people. What does this tell us about human nature? It tells us that 25% of men are liars. <laughs> a more likely possibility is that human nature is and always has been extraordinarily complex and that it has always comprised both neurobiological systems that incline us toward violence and neurobiological systems that inhibit us from violence, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, and that what has changed is that historical circumstances increasingly favor our peaceable inclinations. Well, what do I mean by inclinations? Uh, I don't think there is a single uh, human motive called aggression or violence. I think they are, uh, there are many different reasons that people uh, harm other people. One of them is raw exploitation, the harming of a person that just happens to be an obstacle on the path towards something that you want, resulting in rape, plunder, conquest, uh, elimination of rivals, and uh, other uh, forms of violence uh, by convenience. There's a very different motive of dominance, the uh, drive among individuals to climb the pecking order and become alpha male, and a corresponding drive projected outward to the group for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. There's revenge or moralistic violence in which people are convinced not only that violence is permissible, but rather that it is mandatory. That is, you can't let someone get away with some sin or infraction, but they must be punished resulting in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. And then going from the level of the individual brain to the greater social network of, of uh, brains, there are utopian ideologies, ideas that spread from uh, one mind to another, such as militant religions, nationalism, Nazism, and communism, that justify uh, massive amounts of violence through a kind of pernicious cost-benefit analysis. If your belief system holds out the hope of a world that will be infinitely good forever, well, you can commit pretty much as much violence as you want, and the ends will also always justify the means. Also, let's say that you, as a seer, announce your vision of a perfect world, and there are some people who just don't get with the program. Uh, they uh, somehow uh, don't see it your way and stand in the way of an infinitely perfect world. How evil are they? Well, you do the math. Uh, as they used to say in uh, the uh, Soviet uh, uh, attempted utopia, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, ignoring the fact that human beings are not eggs. Uh, but, the, and, but helping to understand why, paradoxically, the worst incidents of bloodletting in human history were motivated by a, ideal, a moralistic ideology. Well, all that sounds pretty depressing. Uh, what do we have on the other side? What are the so-called better angels of our nature that can uh, pull us away from violence? Well, there's self-control, circuitry in the prefrontal cortex that can anticipate the consequences of behavior and inhibit our violent urges. Presumably, that's why, though three-quarters of men fantasize about killing other people, a tiny fraction of those men actually act on those fantasies. There's empathy, the ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, a set of norms and uh, taboos, what uh, Anthony Appiah writes about in the Honor Code, where he calls it a sense of honor. And then there's reason, um, cognitive processes that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. The question now is, how do we put the psychology back together with the history? Which historical developments bring out our better angels and stay our hands before they can commit acts of bloodshed? One possibility is that Hobbes got it right when he called for a leviathan, uh, 
a government and judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. A Leviathan, or at least a state and judicial system, with a monopoly on violence can neutralize the incentive for exploitative attack by uh, imposing costs on aggression which cancel out the anticipated gain. Uh, that not only can um, inhibit you from committing acts of violence, but it can calm everyone down because uh, you know that not only is the Leviathan penalizing your aggression, but perhaps more important, he's penalizing the aggression of your enemies and your neighbors. And so it may have a knock-on effect where it reduces the need for a preemptive strike to do it to them before they do it to you. It reduces the need to maintain a constant belligerent macho stance to prove the uh, credibility of your deterrent, to show that you are uh, mean and tough and bad enough to retaliate should the need arise. And of course, it reduces the need for vengeance after the fact, because you can outsource it to uh, the government. Uh, moreover, the fact that revenge is outsourced, that it is being meted out by a disinterested party, circumvents the self-serving biases that social psychologists have shown human beings are prone to. Namely, in any human dispute, both sides sincerely believe that their opponent's attacks are unprovoked aggression out of the blue, whereas their own attacks are justified retaliation after the fact. When you have two sides of a dispute, both under the spell of these self-serving delusions, you can have uh, indefinite cycles of revenge and vendetta and blood feud, something that can be nipped in the bud when it's a disinterested third party that is assessing harms and meeting out punishments. Some historical evidence comes from the pacifying and civilizing effects of states that I uh, mentioned at the outset of the talk and the fact that you can watch this movie in reverse when uh, government retreats, leaving behind zones of anarchy, which are almost inevitably violent, such as the American Wild West, where the cliche of the old cowboy movies was that the nearest sheriff is 90 miles away, so you have to defend yourself with your six-shooter, in failed states, in collapsed empires, and in contraband economies, such as those controlled by mafias and street gangs, those that deal in uh, drugs or conflict minerals or during prohibition uh, illicit hooch, where if you uh, feel that you've been cheated in a business deal, you can't press a lawsuit, uh, or if you feel threatened by one of your rivals, you can't dial 911. The only way to survive in business is through a, a credible uh, determination to avenge harms uh, inflicted against you. Uh, which is why some of the most violent zones in the world today uh, are in contraband economies where the dispute resolution apparatus of the state uh, cannot apply. A second hypothesis is the uh, Enlightenment idea of du commerce, gentle commerce, the idea that plunder is a zero-sum game, the uh, aggressor's gain is the victim's loss, but trade is a positive-sum game, one in which everybody wins. And as improving technology allows goods and ideas to be exchanged over longer distances, among larger groups of people, and at lower cost, it becomes cheaper to buy things than to steal them, and more and more of the rest of the world becomes more valuable to you alive than dead. Some historical evidence comes from a number of statistical studies that show that countries with open economies and a greater dependence on international trade uh, host fewer wars, are riven by fewer uh, civil wars and are uh, devastated by fewer genocides. A third hypothesis is um, been called the expanding circle by Peter Singer in his book by that title, but the idea goes back at least to Charles Darwin, namely that evolution has equipped humans with a sense of empathy, but by default, the emotion of empathy applies only within a narrow circle of blood relatives, close allies, and cute little fuzzy baby animals. But over the course of history, you can see the circle of sympathy expanding to embrace the village, the clan, the tribe, the nation, other races, both sexes, children, and perhaps someday other sentient species. <laughs> 
Well, this just begs the question of what expanded the circle, and it is plausible that the technologies that enhance cosmopolitan sentiments are a contributor. The rise of travel, of the consumption of history, of literature and drama and journalism, uh, and indeed a number of experiments have shown that when people are exposed to a narrative from a real person, or for that matter, a fictitious person, they become more sympathetic to that individual, but also toward the category of people that that individual represents. Finally, a fourth hypothesis is the escalator of reason, the possibility that the growth of literacy, education, and public discourse has encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. They rise above their parochial vantage point, which makes it harder to privilege your own interests over other people's just because you're you and they're not. It encourages people to stand back and recognize the futility of cycles of violence and increasingly see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. Some historical evidence comes from another little known and to many people uh, thoroughly incredible fact uh, the pattern in which abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ tests, have increased over the course of the 20th century, the so-called Flynn effect, by which IQ scores have increased by about three points a, a decade throughout the 20th century. Other studies have shown that people and societies with higher levels of education and measured intelligence commit fewer violent crimes, cooperate more in experimental games, have more classically liberal attitudes, such as opposition to racism, uh, xenophobia, and homophobia, and are more receptive to democracy 10 years down the line, holding other factors constant. The final question that I'll uh, ask is, why do so many forces seem to push in the same direction? If I'm right that at least four historical developments have brought out our better angels, uh, what could have made us uh, so fortunate? Now, I don't believe in any mysterious dialectical process or arc that bends toward justice, but rather I think that there, there is a plausible answer to this question, which is that violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma, namely that it is always tempting to an aggressor to exploit a victim, but of course the harm done to the victim is much greater than the gain enjoyed by the aggressor. Since over the long run, aggressors can become victims and vice versa, everyone really would be, objectively speaking, better off if everyone could agree to avoid violence. The dilemma is, how do you get the other guy to refrain from violence at the same time as you do? Because if you beat your swords into plowshares, but the other guy keeps his swords as swords, uh, you could be in big trouble. It is not implausible, I think, to, to uh, think that over the course of history, human experience and human ingenuity have gradually come to solve this problem, just like we've dealt with other scourges of the human condition, like pestilence and hunger. And the common denominator among those four pacifying forces is that all of them serve to increase the material, emotional, or cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously. Well, regardless of what the best explanation of the decline of violence turns out to be, I think it has implications that are profound. For one thing, I think it calls for a reorientation of our efforts towards violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. That is, instead of just lamenting, why is there war, perhaps a question we should be asking is, why is there ever peace? Not just what are we doing wrong, but what have we been doing right? because I hope to have convinced you we have been doing something right, and it strikes me as rather important to try to identify what exactly it is. Uh, also, I think the decline of violence calls for a reassessment of modernity, of the centuries-long trend that has eroded family, tribe, tradition, and religion, uh, which have given way to individual rights, cosmopolitanism, reason, and science. And I'll just make a little side comment now that is relevant perhaps to the theme of this conference, uh, which is that the notion of human rights, which almost sounds uh, kind of um, uh, saccharine or banal, kind of like mother pie and, and apple, uh, <laughs> apple pie and motherhood, not mother pie and applehood, uh, 
seems like something that is too uh, innocuous and banal and sentimental to devote a conference to. But um, uh, as a matter of fact, the com concept of human rights is, I, I think, uh, exotic, unnatural, and historically recent, precisely because it pushes back against another, uh, a number of uh, highly potent uh, cultural forces that connect to human nature, such as family, tribe, tradition, and religion. And it's only with the erosion of those uh, very powerful forces that the concept that every individual has rights on account, simply on account of being a sentient, experiencing human mind uh, has been able to find a toehold. But perhaps that's an issue that, we, that will be explored uh, tomorrow and Saturday morning. But going back to modernity, uh, everyone acknowledges that modernity has brought us many gifts, longer and healthier lives, less ignorance and superstition, richer experiences, but there's always been a current of uh, nostalgia and romanticism that has questioned the price. Is it worth it if we have to live under the shadow of terrorism, genocide, world wars, and nuclear weapons? On the other hand, if despite casual impressions, the long-term trend, though halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing, uh, I argue that that calls for a rehabilitation of the ideals of modernity and progress, and it is certainly a cause for gratitude for the institutions of civilization and enlightenment that have made it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have both uh, time and uh, microphones for questions. Yes, can you find a microphone? I think this is being recorded or broadcasted or webcasted or all three. There's one right here. So my, my question is about, well, how do I turn this on is my first question. I, I, it is on. It is just, on? Just keep okay. your mouth close to it. Okay. Yeah.